Okay, welcome everybody. It is Saturday the 23rd of January 2021 and we have today a uh, presentation by Dr. Zania Payne from Jackson College. Uh, she's a professor of physics and astronomy out there and uh, an outstanding colleague and a wonderful, wonderful pal for being willing to put together a presentation for you. And she did something that is really tough for uh, anybody who teaches or just studies science to do, which is to kind of bridge worlds. And so for this talk, uh, she's gonna be sharing a little bit about electricity and what does electricity have to do with being alive and how does that connect with the way we think about electricity and living things in kind of everyday pop culture. And so it's a wide ranging talk, but she's gonna give us lots of really useful and interesting uh, science. And we'll have time at the end for questions. So if you wanna put questions in the, in the chat, we can refer back to them later. Uh, but we're gonna go ahead and get started here. I'm going to uh, share my screen and make sure that it's, make sure that it's working here. So I'm gonna click on this, make sure it's ready to go. Share that. Okay, I'll click on present, and then I'm going to get out of the, get out of the screen so that Zania can share with us. So welcome, Zania. Thanks for being here. Oh, it's such a pleasure, and I'm so happy that you asked me to do this. I, I had a fantastic time um, trying to tie physics uh, to biology, and then rethinking about um, what it means to be alive. So I guess we'll get started. All right, so as I was thinking about this whole topic, um, the way I organized it in my brain is the way I have presented it in my overview here. So we're gonna start with a history of some relevant benchmarks in the different fields of study. And then I'm gonna give you some basic physics regarding electricity. And then I'm gonna to try to tie that to how electricity is part of all living things. And then some variations that we see in nature. So um, not just, human beings, but the rest of the animal kingdom, there's some variations. And then I'm going to be interested in how electricity must have been involved in the very first life. And finally, how far have we gotten in science for actually animating life in the laboratory? All right, so to understand this whole topic, it's probably good to have a, a, a quick history lesson. This is by no means exhaustive, but um, I wanted to start the conversation, or at least start the history of the conversation with William Gilbert, who's actually the first person who did a comprehensive study of electric and magnetic properties. And, you know, of the, at the day, they were just doing um, what I would call static electricity um, experiments. So like rubbing a balloon on your dog to see if it will stick on the wall, that sort of thing. But at that time, that was a big deal because they didn't really understand what was happening. Um, and Gilbert, who was actually a physician, um, put together six volume treaties on rubbing things together and producing static electricity. So it's pretty exhaustive. He was also the first person to think about the earth as actually a big bar magnet. So that was a pretty um, innovative thought of the day. Um, then we're fast forwarding through uh, Newton's publications, and that these publications were all about classical classical mechanics, which has something to do with forces and motion, um, and that's key to understanding eventually the electrostatic force. And you can see that it's not till the 17 and 1800s where that starts to pick up speed. So the first capacitor, uh, Benjamin Franklin doing his work with lightning, the first battery. Uh, and then Gal Galvani's studies um, actually applying voltages to dismembered frog legs. And it goes further. They even did it on human cadavers. And you can see that at that time, the science fiction of the time would have been Frankenstein. So actually Mary Shelley took inspiration from those uh, experiments that Galvani had done. All right, and then we pick up speed again in, through the 1800s. Um, and we get to all the way up to the 1900s and you can see all the wonderful things associated with motors and light bulbs and Tesla coils. Um, and then it looks like I stopped talking about physics 
completely, uh, but that's because um, physics went on to do uh, other interesting things that are not related to this talk. So it's not like physicists just sat on their butts and weren't doing anything for the rest of the 1900s. They're certainly doing things. Um, you, you can see that I've interwoven in this um, some history associated with some biology. So if we backtrack a little bit, um, we actually see that um, in the mid 1800s, we had organic molecules being synthesized out of in inorganic molecules. Uh, we have uh, the first isolation of DNA from a cell. Uh, and then in the mid 50, uh, 1950s, we have some of the first attempts to try to make life in a laboratory. So zapping chemicals to see if we could get that done. And then as early, as recent as 2010, we have our first synthetic bacteria. So some serious biomedical engineering going on these days. All right, and I have this um, amazing knowledge doubling curve to share with you. And this was um, first put forth by Buck, uh, Buck Mr. Fuller. Um, and these days, because of the sheer number of people involved in the internet, we're doubling knowledge nearly a yearly rate and thou and now maybe even up to a daily rate i know it isn't it crazy that's no great. way to keep up i can't keep up <laughs> nobody can <laughs> oops okay so we're going to do a bit now on um really the nature of electricity so you know the this whole talk is about, in essence, Coulomb's law, which is that thing you learned maybe in fifth grade about opposites attracting or likes repelling. Um, and so, so that force, which is fundamental to the four forces in nature, is really responsible for um, holding the electrons on an atom. And then going past that, it's responsible for the interactions of individual atoms that make bonds, chemical bonds. And so those chemical bonds are, make the molecules that make you. And they respond by electrostatic forces. And so really you are all about electricity. So to understand that a little bit better, instead of just considering two charged particles, then maybe you consider an entire plate of negative charge that's up in the corner there. So that's what that means, those little green balls, a uh, whole plate of negative charge and, and how a positive charge would experience that whole plate and it would become crashing down on top of that plate. And that should make you think of something very similar and that is just dropping a ball while you're holding it on the surface of earth. And, and because you know you've had that experience of dropping that ball on the surface of the earth, you, you realize, oh, that's potential energy, that's gravitational potential energy associated with the gravitational force. And that's the thing that causes that ball to fall to the earth and the higher you hold it, the faster it goes, All right? That concept of potential energy is really what voltage is all about. So now think about holding two charged balls up above a sheet of negative charge and then releasing that ball of positive charge the higher you release it from, the faster it's gonna crash into that surface of negative charge. And you've stumbled upon electric potential energy. And that's what volts is all about. So when you go to the store and you buy your five volt battery, you're buying the potential to move charges around. That's what you're doing. So it, you know they sell you five volts, you can hook up whatever you want. And now you can have that whatever you want, pick up kinetic energy. And that's really what current's all about. <laughs> All right, so we don't particularly move uh, positive charges around when we're talking about electricity. We move uh, negative charges around, which are known as electrons, and that's really what current's all about. And the reason for this is got something to do with metallic bonding. So in metallic bonding, you have a lattice, so an array of positively charged nuclei that are sitting um, evenly spaced from each other. And then the big black circles that you see up in the corner there represent the orbits of, or the uh, positions of the orbits of the electrons. And you can see that they go past 
the next nearest neighbor. And what that does is it confuses those outer electrons. And it's like, who do I belong to? I'm not sure. Why don't I belong to everybody at once? Yeah, it's like a big commune. All right, so you've got all these electrons that are called conduction electrons, and they're just a little confused who they belong to, but they're bound in the metal. No worries, they're not gonna get out. Okay, so that makes metal special with this metallic, metallic bonding. And that means that we are able to, to apply a voltage or hook this piece of metal up to a battery, and that will push the charges around. So that's the picture we do have in the corner. Yes, thank you. Um, and so the idea here is on the one left hand side plate, so that's a big metal plate. Oh, yeah, that's the one. Um, since it's been hooked up to the positive side of the battery, what's going to happen is electrons are going to want to be coming away from that plate and going towards the battery. Because remember, opposites attract, right? So that's as simple as that is. And then they're pushed through the battery, thank you battery, and over to the other plate. And you produce this huge charge separation. And this is fantastic, this huge charge separation. What that means is you contain this beautiful electric field in, the, in between those two plates. And if you plop another little positive charge in the middle, oops, oh, there, there he is. He's gonna get pushed over to that plate. Very good, yeah, exactly. So you have a way to contain that force and it's so useful. All right, so it's like uh, you could disconnect the battery now and you could have that, uh, that capacitor, which is what you've created, and you could discharge that capacitor. And so a capacitor is like a little mini battery, portable one. Okay, now what we're gonna do is fill that space with a conductor. Good job. <laughs> and in that conductor are all these free electrons. Remember, that's metallic bonding, all those communal electrons, and they're going to migrate in that direction, indeed. And now you've set yourself up for a full circuit, uh, and then you can decide that you've, you're done with the capacitor and this piece of metal. You can just put a headlight there instead. It's the same concept. So there's plenty of free electrons moving around that circuit, and that's what current is all about. Okay. <laughs> You want to talk about the flux capacitor? <laughs> well, I, I, I found this. I thought it was just absolutely hilarious that uh, this is a real thing. You can go there and you can try to buy it. Uh, and then you can look at the comments <laughs> in the Otto O'Reilly, O'Reilly's Auto Parts uh, website saying how many people have attempted to buy this thing and no, it is really not for sale, but it is literally <laughs> in their catalog. So is it really? It certainly is. I didn't know that. Yeah. I thought you made that. I thought no, you, that's, that's, that's a real thing. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our um, newfound knowledge of charge separation and start creating arcs and sparks and lightning. Um, now you scuff across the floor and then you reach out and grab that um, nice little doorknob or anything metallic. In fact, I, I did this today because it's so dry and I was getting in and out of my truck and zapped every damn time, every, every, every time. <laughs> every time. Um, and you might say to yourself, well, goodness, aren't your fingers in the doorknob kind of like a capacitor? And they are. They're kind of like a capacitor. They're two conductors nearby each other. And there shouldn't be any arcs and sparks and lightning, right? Because air is really a pretty good insulator in general. But what happens here is you build up so much charge on your fingers that it's that it um, polarizes the doorknob. So you can see where I've got the electrons pushed away, because remember, that's a conductor. Those electrons can move, so they get pushed away. And then you're left with all those protons sitting there right next to your fingers, and you create this huge electric field in between the two in the space that overwhelms the space. And so that spark that you're getting is literally the electrons jumping across to the doorknob. And so it's like it's like current flowing through air, like it's current without a wire, basically. And, and so on that short scale, you're actually producing a huge voltage. All right, so air has something called a breakdown potential. It's 3 million volts per meter. Now, I'm not suggesting that you ever create a meter long spark. That would be terrifying and you <laughs> won't live through it. But um, that's the per meter just means that if you did have 
uh, a spark that's a meter long, then you're dealing with 3 million volts. OK, so if you're doing something like making a centimeter long spark, then you're talking about 30,000 volts. All right. Now, generally speaking, when you're you know, shocking yourself on the doorknob, you're not even seeing that much of a spark. So you're probably getting you're probably more on the order of 3000 volts as opposed to 30,000. But um, we're going to show you some discharge tubes here in a minute and you'll see um, sparks that long. So you'll, you'll have a sense of how much voltage difference there is between your fingers and that doorknob if it could indeed be a centimeter long. All right, so lightning is really just this. And the simplified model of lightning is in the thundercloud because of the convection that goes on. Um, we have ionization of the molecules in that cloud. And what that means is the electrons are getting rubbed off the atoms. So now you have free electrons um, that end up on the bottom of the cloud and the ions, the positive ions end up on the top of the cloud. Um, and more importantly, all those charges building up are just like on your fingers, okay? So they build up on your fingers and then on the ground, it's the same thing as a doorknob, the electrons on whatever that is, is that a tree? Mm -hmm. It looks yeah. like a tree. Okay, so the free electrons on the tree will go to the literal ground, leaving the tree itself positive. And so you've got exactly the same effect, but now it is truly... Uh, on the order of a billion volts. And you get that arcing that occurs. So the pink color, the pink color here has got to do with the um, color of ionization of air. So that's what that is, the, the particular elements in air. And, and really it's the hydrogen that glows the pink, right? So, so that's what you're seeing is that in essence, you have current running without a wire from a thundercloud down to the ground. And that's cool. It's very cool. Unless you're the thing on the ground. Right? You're the thing on the ground. <laughs> and then it's quite warm. Yes. Okay. So, you know, you scuff your feet around on the floor, and that's cool. Um, the, 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 there's a fancy name for that scuffing around. It's called the triboelectric effect. And when I was talking about that physician, uh, Gilbert, in his six volume treatise on how you make electrostatic. Uh, uh, charges or the electrostatic effect. That's really what he was studying, rubbing materials together to see how they uh, were able to pull electrons off one and then leave the other thing behind being positive. But mind you, at, at his time, they didn't know about electrons and protons. That was way in the, way. Fu way in the future. They just knew that you could make this really cool effect. All right, so if you don't want to do that and you feel you're feeling lazy, go buy yourself a Van de Graaff generator, which you, you can actually buy them. They're not that expensive. Um, uh, and what they do is, in essence, rub two surfaces together for you with a motor. Um, and the motors at the base, there, that's, yep, so that turns that uh, uh, insulator. And then there is a rubber um, belt that runs around to the top, which is connected to that. Um, metal dome, and the charges then get distributed across the metal dome. And then what happens is exactly in every instance we've described, right, it's the same thing, except this time around the excess electrons are on a discharge ball as opposed to on the primary uh, source itself. So we just reverse the polarity, but still there's that huge electric field that gets uh, created and the electrons will jump across and make current out in the air. All right, the largest one is in a museum in Boston. I have not been there. I did, actually did not even know it existed. I don't know where it is. Um, so just the Science Museum in Boston. Um, just to give you a sense of frame, right. that's a person right there. Right. It's a person. So a tiny little person. This is a person, I think, running it yes. in a cage. In the cage. In a cage. <gasps> yes, the Faraday cage. That's a magical, magical thing. And so notice in this Faraday cage, it's not a solid piece of metal. It's a bit like chicken wire or, you know, it's got pl plenty of room for, you might think, the electric field to get in. But what's amazing about this cage is 
as soon as the electrons on the cage, it has to be a metal cage, can't be just a, any old cage made out of wood, it has to be metal because what we want to utilize is the fact that the electrons can redistribute themselves. And when they do so, that neutralizes the electric field coming from the outside. So if you do happen to be in a situation where you think you're gonna be struck by lightning, the best place for yourself to be I mean, if you're just wandering about, is to get in it, get in your chicken coop, <laughs> or get in your car, right? Unless it's a plastic car, don't do that. <laughs> get, in, get in your metal car because that's enough of a Faraday cage to save your life. So we need to pay homage to the electron today. I think after Absolutely. this lecture, I think so. Absolutely. I think we had a, um, a short video from the World Wide Web. Do you want to show that now? Yeah, okay. let's show that now. Okay, let's see if I can pull that up. So let me do this. Okay, so this video is basically showing you, um, again, the discharge which you would see from, that's the grounded ball, and then the, um, the motors, the base of this device here. You can't really see the rubber belt running up and down, but it does. It builds up that extra charge on that sphere, and then eventually it reach, reaches the ability to arc. And so, you know, based on that 10 centimeters of arcing, we can get an estimate of how much voltage difference there is between those two surfaces. Yeah, and so the, the distance between those is actually pretty small, but it's way bigger than the distance you'd get from a a shock on a doorknob. Absolutely. So that's telling you this is a huge voltage right right between these two. So do you want to show more? Or is it, I think that, yeah, that's good. Um, yeah. cool. So we'll go back to the presentation now. There's just so much to talk about. Absolutely. <laughs> okay so this is a little bit of a different way to create, uh, create um, your arc sparks and lightning. And this is called the Tesla coil. Um, and Tesla coils are cool because they're related to transformers. And so just a, a transformer is really two coils. And what's truly phenomenal about this is you put alternating current through a coil, you get big gushes of magnetic field through that coil. And then you put a receiving coil nearby and that receiving coil senses these big gushes of magnetic field and then responds by producing its own alternating current. So you get a sender and a receiver. And that's really awesome because you don't, they don't have to be attached. Um, and so in a Tesla coil, it's souped up a little bit. So they add a capacitor in there. And then what that does is supercharges the voltages that you could produce on these, the, the sender and then the receiver. Um, and then the voltages get so high that you get that fantastic arcing. Um, so I have a couple of references here. Um, they used a Tesla coil in the Sorcerer's Apprentice and you can see the individuals are in their Faraday cage because even though it's alternating current and it's less, uh, there's more fluctuations in that uh, electric field and you're less likely to get um, electrocuted, you still, I think, you, I think, you know, err on the side of caution, right? I mean, it's like, you know, it's fun to grab on the electric fence because it <laughs> pulses, right? And you're gonna, <laughs> and you're probably gonna live through that, but um, um, you don't really wanna be doing that too often. Um, all right, now you can even go further with this. And so if you like uh, heavy metal music, uh, you can put yourself in your own chain mail suit. Check this guy out if you can see him or you can watch any number of videos on the World Wide Web of, of Architect. This is actually a band who utilizes the connect. Well, so what they do is they build their own souped up Tesla coils. All right, and then not only, not only does the band have to play in chain mail, um, but they also have um, connected somehow their musical instruments to the Tesla coils. So as the, as the music is playing to a particular rhythm, so does the lightning um, get created. So it's quite a spectacular show. All right, we have a few Tesla coil, coil videos from Jackson College. Um, now these are by no means as impressive as Architect, but they're good teaching demos. Let's see if I can 
I'm going to have to share a, a different screen here. So let me pull them up. Let me open this one here. Press the core. Oh. This one to open. And I'm going to have to share the correct screen here. Boop. Okay, so this looks a little bit like a cattle prod that I'm about to hold up. <laughs> and that's kind of the nature of it. So pointy bits with electric field are much better at allowing for that current to jump across. So that's basically electrons jumping across. Um, and that green glow, so the purple is the hydrogen gas being ionized and that green glow is the electrons being created. Yeah, that's a good idea. So will you point out to them um, the cathode and the anode in that tube? That's a, this is called a uh, cathode ray tube. And the whole point of this was to create, it's a vacuum tube, it's to create a beam of electrons. And so the electrons jump across from the Tesla coil to this piece of metal there, yep. And then through a collimator, which is like a little hole, a slit cut. So that it's, it makes the beam of electrons very clear. Of course, it's really glowing green. So it's a little hard to see the beam down the middle. Yeah, and then there's an anode or a, a collector on the other side. So those free electrons end up on another piece of metal. So they're not running around the room because nobody wants bunches of electrons running around the room. Um, and, and that's the nature of this. So. The pink again is the hydrogen being ionized because the electrons are jumping across. And then that green glow is a stream of electrons, um, which I use in the classroom to show the effects of magnetic fields. But I guess you'll just have to take the class to see how <laughs> that goes. So I'm going to share another video here. I just got to pull it up. All and right. And let me get the, I got to share here. Share first. Oops. Okay. I can figure out where my. Okay, where is it? No, oh, where'd it go? There we go. Let's see, where is share screen? Share screen, there we go. Boop, this one. All right, so this is a slightly different type of Tesla coil. Um, you can see the actual coil. So you're seeing the receiving coil. Um, and then on the top of that, we have a uh, ball that's collecting the uh, excess charge and I'm discharging that on a secondary ball, much like the Van de Graaff. Um, in, in this image, you can also see a little extra lightning being created a lot, uh, out into the air um, because it doesn't really know where to go. It's having a hard time finding that. Um, if you have a nice big Tesla coil like those uh, architect does, then that lightning will just discharge right out into the air and, and land wherever. And it has to do with the air currents and uh, makeup of the air in the room. So it's a little bit unpredictable. Yeah. And so one of the things that's really cool about Tesla coils is even if you don't have the discharge tube, so like right here, the, the Tesla coil is still going and it's discharging, but you can't see it because it's discharging in so right. many different directions. Right all at the same time. And one of the, the cool features with uh, Tesla, Tesla coils like this is you can get discharge uh, from the Tesla coil to actually blow out candles because mm. it's creating air movement oh, yeah. around that. And yeah. so, so you don't think you, you don't think about that electric field being there, but it's totally there and it's moving the air molecules as well. Sure, so. absolutely. Because air molecules in, in many instances are ions. And, and so, in, but even if they're not ions, a lot of molecules are just polarized. So they're going to respond. Yeah, like water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. So there's that one. And I think we have one more. One more. Show, show here. Pull this one up. And then we'll get the, hold on, where's my zoom window here? Share this one. Boop. Right, there's this one. This one. No, no, no. Not this one. Yep. Okay. Ah, yeah, this one. Okay, so dovetailing off what Steve just said, um, that electric field is out in the air. And so that electric field is being able to energize the two ends of these light uh, bulbs that normally it would have to plug in to a socket. And each of these light bulbs has got a different uh, chemical in it. So this is, he the last thing I'm holding up there is helium. That's the glow of a helium gas. The first one I held up was a neon gas. Um, and, and so the 
actual electric field is creating a voltage difference in space. So that's pretty exciting. And that's what Tesla was really interested in, by the way, historically speaking. He was thinking, why can't we just send electricity out in space? What do we need all these wires for? But unfortunately, I think, I think it should be, well, pretty obvious that it's the, the field's going to diminish, <laughs> right? And then what is the extra electricity going to land on? Um, but it nonetheless is a fantastic idea, especially the usage of the two coil system, which is pretty much on every electrical device that we have. It's on your house, it's on, on your hair dryer, um, because that allows for you to adjust the voltage in each of those devices. Mm -hmm. Wow, people are so smart. It's amazing. You think about all the smart people that have come before us, right? <laughs> and what do we do? <laughs> we're just we're, we're advertising. We're just yeah. hanging out. Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna go back to the presentation here. Yeah, we'll continue. So that was, and we already talked about Faraday cages, right? We did. And you can see there's a Faraday cage in this, uh, in this, and I think they also have somebody who's running it down for the architect. They of course probably have a Faraday cage sure. to protect the electronic equipment that they're yes. using as well. Okay, here we dovetail into biology. So, whoa, slow down, Tiger. Okay. All right, so um, you are an electrical being. You have electrical impulses running all over your body. And we have these very complicated structures in our body to allow that to happen. Um, but it really does boil down to charged particles and charged particle movement. So it's, you can see on the, um, the graphic to the right, the reference to the Coulomb force. And the Coulomb force, again, that's just that opposites attract and likes repel. Um, and so um, that is fundamental to all of the electrical properties of your body. So no matter how, matter how complicated that biology video you're watching becomes, you have to keep that in the back of your mind. Okay, so uh, this picture that you see, this complicated picture with the pink band, that pink band is supposed to be a, is a representation of a cell membrane. Cells have these phenomenal membranes, which I'll show graphics later on how they're actually constructed. But for right now, um, what we're seeing is sodium ions not being able to get in the cell membrane but there being a way for potassium ions to go one way and chlorine ions to go the other way. And what that does, you can see the pluses and minuses show up there, that's creating a voltage difference across the cell membrane. And this is an amazing thing. So the cell membrane itself is like a little battery. It's astonishing. <laughs> just astonishing. Okay. Um, and yeah, it's about 70 millivolts. That's what that is with the M there. So it's a very small potential, but this is really how electrical signals work. Um, that cell membrane is going to change its voltage. And when it does so, that is when a signal is passed down the neuron. So Steve's gonna point out where the signal comes from and it's pathing down the, yeah, it passes down that way. Now you have to understand, and this is a little peculiar because the cell membrane uh, on the picture to the left down the myelin sheath is there. Okay, so the plus minuses are across there, but the, sing the signal goes down the membrane. So that's a little puzzling um, until we get to the next frame to try to understand that. Because normally what you think about is a battery, right? It, it's a direct connection and that battery is gonna push the charges in one direction from the plus to the minus. But now we're saying the battery is connected this away and somehow the current flow is across. And that's a little, that's a little puzzling um, but maybe the next frame will help us understand that a little bit. And it all has to do with this amazing thing <laughs> called uh, the, um, uh, the amazing ability, I should say, yes. The amazing ability as the um, impulse comes to that location in the cell membrane, sodium is allowed to move into the cell membrane and that through channels that allows for the voltage to change 
And that also allows for the next material along the cell membrane to get activated. So this voltage pulse actually moves down the membrane um, because of the influx of these sodium atoms. Exactly, and it stimulates the next nearest neighbor and that impulse goes down as the sodium cascades in. Now you may think the cell is now screwed because <laughs> it's got all the sodium in it, but there's something amazing about this cell membrane that I haven't told you yet. There is something called a sodium and potassium pump and that pump, just like a uh, sunk pump in your, sunk, sunk pump? Sunk pump. Sunk mm -hmm. pump in your basement, I mean, your basement's flooded, you have a way to pump that out. So it's exactly the same in a cell. There are special um, channels in the cell membrane that can actually function to push the sodium back out again, such that it's back in its resting state waiting for the next impulse. Feel me, Doug? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty impressive. It is amazingly impressive. So that though the polarity is this way, we're able to send that action potential down the cell and that impulse then can tell you to pick up a pencil, punch a wall. I mean, ouch, that hurt. Oh yeah, right. Or, huh, isn't that person pretty? Yeah, huh? exactly. And it, what's also weird about this for me is that the your hair on fire versus a spider crawling on you feeling those two different feelings give. Uh, are, are, are transmitted by the same voltage difference. So your cell never goes more than negative 70 to plus 50 millivolts. That's it, that's all it's got, right? That's as many ions that can go one way or the other way. Um, so to transmit the fact that, oh my gosh, your hair's on fire, do something now, um, these impulses come more rapidly, right? Because we didn't talk about the time frame. So that's something else your brain can do too, is send the impulses faster. And then you know, you better do something now. So frequency versus amplitude. Right. right? If you're thinking in terms of right. waves, right? that's a way to think about it. Exactly. And so you can abs absolutely think about these action potentials as like a voltage wave down the cell wall. Okay, now luckily, luckily, your brain does not have to send impulses to keep your heart going. So there's actually an electro electrical system in your heart itself, and that is called, or it's located in the SA node, the sinoatrial node. And that is some very interesting cell, there's some very interesting cells there because um, they have to function independently. In fact, if you took your heart, take, take a heart, not just your heart, any heart out of your body, it will actually continue to beat for up to three minutes because those cells are still firing. They don't need any you know, impetus from the brain. Now, of course, if, if you need to run, right, it, it, or you need to run from something, um, adrenaline will flow and that will, uh, those are impulses that will increase your heart rate so your brain does have some control over your heart, but your resting heart rate, no, it's controlled by the SA node. And how this works, again, these are still cells, they still have that cell membrane, but those, the membranes on those cells have extra channels. And so sodium is naturally flowing through those extra channels. It doesn't have to wait for that, that action potential to show up from the brain. It's just flowing and then the heart will discharge, right? So it's building up its own action potential and then the heart discharges or the cells discharge. And when they do so, those signals go through um, the, if you look at the diagram yep, on, the, on that, those were the signals go from the SI node and they're received by a secondary node, the atrial ventricular node. And then those cells send that action potential through. Now that fires about a 10th of a second later. So that gives some time for the first signals to come through, the next signal to be processed, the heart squeezes, the blood goes out. And then by then the SA node is sending the next one. Isn't it amazing? That's it's amazing. so complicated. It's so, no. Biology is easy. <laughs> Biology is scary. It is scary. There's a lot to know. Okay. All right. So now we're getting into well, what happens if the SI node screws up, 
Okay, and it can it can happen. It can screw up. And those if those pulses are not coming in regularly, then they don't get interpreted regularly by the uh, AV node. And so then you get into atrial fibrillation. So the blood isn't getting pumped out in big bursts like you need. Um, so we have to do something to set that right again. Okay, so, and remember all this has to do with sodium, I, sodium ions being able to come across that cell membrane. So something has disrupted that ability and that's when um, the person goes into AFib. All right, let's check out the next slide. Okay. All right, so say um, you are going into, you're going into, uh, your heart's going into atrial fibrillation, then you wanna defibrillate, right? That defibrillate. Um, and uh, we wanna be clear here that the purpose of this is not to start the heart. You can't start the heart. You can stop. The fibrillation though, yep. does it make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so what this whole purpose, the purpose is, is to send a huge bur a burst of current and it can be up to 10 amps depending on that, uh, the placement of those paddles, right? So, and the reason that would be different is because you change the direction of these paddles and slight separation, it's not always perfect. You're changing the resistance between the two and the more resistance you have between the paddles then the less current you get. So that paddle placement is dictating how much current you get. So I say about, about 10 amps. Okay, and then um, the paddles, you can change the voltage to, uh, you know, somewhere from 200 to 1000 volts, depending on, you know, how much juice you want to give these people to, to depolarize the muscle tissue. That's what you're doing. You're, you're telling, you're, you're sending a big burst of current through there to tell the tissue, calm down calm down, let the SA nodes start all over again because you've got all these electrical signals flying around in there. Time is a factor. So every two minutes, the likelihood of you being able to resurrect somebody, resurrect them, uh, um, dwindles, okay? And about after 10 minutes, it just is, it's not gonna work anymore. Um, so, I mean, I make some uh, pop culture references here. I, there was a movie in the 90s um, which was just yesterday, right? It was just <laughs> yesterday. Um, and where people were um, stopping their hearts and trying to restart their hearts, I guess, with the uh, paddles. And that's just a fallacy. You cannot restart your heart with paddle. However, if you give yourself a big shot of adrenaline right to the heart, then you can actually resurrect somebody in this and that, fashion. That adrenaline is like... Um it kickstarts that process. It really kind of pushes that, um, that depolarization. It makes the, 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 the signal kind of, um, that's what I'm looking for. I'm, I'm trying to, uh, I got nothing. The adrenaline is a hormone mm -hmm. that allows for those uh, sodium potassium pumps to do what they're supposed to do. Uh -huh. In right. a particularly fast way. Yes. Uh, there we go. So I, I it allows that. for the SA node cells, cell membranes to function as they should because they, they have stopped, right? Yeah. So the adrenaline allows for that depolarization to occur. All right, we got the language. Yay, we're getting it. A couple of physicists talking biology. I so, know, right? That's so scary. Who? Okay, so... Uh, there are a number of animals in uh, the animal kingdom that have what I would consider electrical powers. Like they, some of them use um, electrical fields almost like a, a sixth sense. So for instance, um, a few that impressed me because I have honeybees. So I didn't know that when a honeybee uh, took pollen off of a, a flower that they actually um, changed the polarity of the flower. So the next bee notices before he even lands. He's like, well, I don't have to land there because I'm picking up a change in the electric field. Isn't that cool? That's so cool. That is very cool. Um, let's see what else. Um, geckos. Uh, geckos. Oh yeah, geckos. They're like, they have like that whole concept of uh, the balloon on the wall going on. Oh, yeah. so it's like an electrostatic charge on their yeah, pads? Yeah. That's how they stick. That's how they stick, man. They're like little balloons on the wall. Oh, that's so cool. How do, how, does, how do they do it? Do you know? 
I don't know how they do yeah. that. No, I don't know, but yeah, I know those. Like that. Hey, I think it's Vanderval's forces for geckos. Oh, oh is it really? Oh, that's kind yeah. Of cool. Yeah. So okay. it's the okay. hydrogen moment. Yeah, hydrogen. Yay, water. Awesome. Cool. All right. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> All right, and then let's see. Um, I did it uh, after after all this long list. I considered talking about all of them, but uh, I think Steve got really excited about the electric eels because of some recent um, technology um, using hydrogels to mimic um, what the electric eels do internally. So an electric eel has um, these organs in its body, a couple, uh, three of them, in fact, um, but the main one and the hunter's one, they're responsible for producing about 600 volts um, stem to stern, is that a phrase, mm -hmm. from one side the, to the head, um, and then releasing up to an amp of current. Um, and the purpose for that is to sting their meals, I guess. Stun them. Stun them yeah, stun their meals. Um, and the way that they accomplish this is by very special cells inside them called electrocytes. And each of these electrocytes um, produces about a tenth or fifteenth of a volt. And you stack them up. They get stacked up in series. So this is more like you would have thought a cell membrane would work where you would have a direct connection from one cell to the next and allowing for current to flow between those cells, just like batteries hooked up in a series. Um, but um, but our, our cell membranes don't work that way. We have a more indirect method of producing that um, action potential or current down a cell. Uh, but, the, but the eels have them stacked up in a way that looks a lot like a series circuit. And if you get enough of them, 6,000 of them, each of the uh, a tenth of a volt, then you're going to get your 600 volts. That's so cool. And so they, they're starting to develop these basically electrocytes, but in a, a hydrogel form uh, separated by this, mm -hmm. I, I assume is like a... Um, it's basically just like a series of um, capacitors, right? That's yeah, kind of uh, yeah. And each of them has different materials in there. So different electrolytes. Some are just water. So they and they, um, yeah, they just function exactly as that. So the, the little packets of them um, are meant to represent the cells. Um, and then each of them has a slightly different um, electrolytic solution. Yeah. So coming to a cell phone near you. <laughs> Electric eel batteries. Well, probably not, but it's pretty cool this technology, and it's, mm -hmm. it's we're getting it from paying close attention to how um, uh, electricity has been managed by living organisms uh, and is you know developed uh, through natural selection. Mm -hmm. Sounds really cool. Okay, so here we're getting to a portion of the lecture about. Well, let's see if if we. We, we're thinking about all the electricity in our bodies. Um, and now we want to uh, get at, well, how do we, uh, if we're really interested in creating life, don't we need to know something about, you know, the, the base, the base level? What, yeah. what are we at the base level? Um, and so life as we know it is really based on six elements, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And all of us and all living things have these six elements and the way they're bonded together makes us us. So if you're trying to create life, because we are trying to animate life or reanimate life, mm -hmm. and we can't do it um, with defib pads and we can't do it with lightning or applying a battery across a cadaver, Maybe if we start messing around with the base chemicals, we could actually make life. So that's been the thinking for the last, oh, I don't know, since the 1950s maybe, is, is can we do that? Um, so if we consider the energy sources, um, and then we also have a sense of what early, early earth was like, so what chemicals would be around, and then can we combine those chemicals with the proper energy sources? Um, and if it's not lightning, um, then maybe it would be impacts from comets and asteroids would be an energy source. 
um, how are we able to do it? Can we recreate that um, building building life in a petri dish? So um, places that you might look um, for this type of simple life um, are affiliated with extremophiles. And so we find microbes, and these are teeny tiny single celled entities. We find them in the deserts, we find them in ice, we find them in boiling water, they, we find them in acid, in salt crystals, and all in underwater volcanoes, toxic waste. I mean, the, it, things want to live, right? They, 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 every, they do. <laughs> and they're going to make do in the most extreme uh, conditions. And so that's what an extremophile is necessary. And, and what's interesting about that is, you know, you, you can't, it's hard to imagine that life would exist without sunlight, but they don't necessarily have to have sunlight. There's other forms of energy associated with any number of reactions or just being by say uh, underwater volcanoes where, they, where you don't get any light um, that you can do the type of chemistry necessary called dark chemistry um, to put the molecules together and form something. Um, and so studying extremophiles is very interesting, especially to astrobiologists because you know, if we're going to find life on places like Mars and Europa um, and, and other extreme conditions in the solar system, um, maybe we'll know what to look for if we understand the extremophiles on Earth. Um, all right, before you go on, um, just a shout out to this fantastic aerial image in uh, Yellowstone National Park. Um, the, there's blue water in the center and it's um, it's got uh, algae and bacteria and other um, ancient microbes are causing the colors around the outside edge. And this is a road. That's like yeah, that's a, a road. Yeah, that's a road right there. And these are cars. That's a truck. Well, that's a truck. Oh, that's a car. a car. Yeah. So it's a it's a big big yeah. place. It's a big place, and and so that's the type of uh, environment we're looking for, and studying these would be uh, these bacteria and algae. And I know Steve uh, Alby Scott has done some uh, work at the Great Salt Lake, uh, looking for extremophiles oh, in yeah. high salinity uh, environments as well. So yeah, so so what you see here often when we see the yellow and the red, it depends on what microorganisms are utilizing for their energy. So this is a situation where you don't have organisms using um, light. You know, they're not they're they're autotrophs, but it, ones that are usually yellow are using sulfur. Ones that are red are usually using iron, and we those are the extremophiles. We often don't see this in any anywhere except salt lakes or hot pots. Mm -hmm. And and this is where and I put this on the side. This is where Miller and Uray came up with this idea when they started saying, well, what goes on in volcanoes and, and what's in us and what they said. You know, if you look at what what uh, Zanya already talked about, what we're made of. Those are the basic building blocks or, or, of life come out of volcanoes. They come out of hot pots. They come out of all this uh, geochemistry. And so what they did was they took all of these gases, they put them in this big sphere and they zapped it with electricity. Mm -hmm. And over, you know, they let it run for three or four months. You might be talking about this in the future, Zania, but they let, yeah, there you go. They let, okay, I'll shut up then. Because I got to go. I got to go call my daughter. So I'm going to be logging off. So I just had to get in my two cents there. All right. We'll have to give you. Get you to talk about this later on too. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> all right. See ya. Yeah, see ya. Must mean it's two o'clock already. So yeah, it's it's pushing it, but we uh, we've got a couple more slides we want to share with you, and then we do want to get to some questions. So uh, we'll take a look real quick at Astro. All, right, all right, real quick. And so real quick, there are places that we're going to be looking. So Mars twenty twenty is about to hit the ground. Um, we're looking in that case for. Uh, ancient life. We're not looking for current life because we don't feel like so far there's much hope for current life. It's not enough water. Um, but Europa, man, that is a really good candidate. Um, and unfortunately, the Europa Clipper mission um, did not get funded. So um, we'll be waiting for a while on that. But there seems to be plenty of reason to believe that there is um, dark chemistry going on underneath the uh, uh, ice layers, and um, it gets its energy from tidal fluxing from Jupiter. So it, it should be warm enough, even though it's so far out in the solar system. Uh, and then a shout out to comets. You know, we've landed on comets. We've harvested stuff from comets. We've sent a lot of things to comets to take observations of. And we've been finding things like amino acids on comets. So that's a pretty 
interesting idea that Plenty you know water that's for sure and wa and there's water um so if if there's those things already being formed in the in the outermost solar system which is where comets come from some serious dark chemistry right there then they collide with earth um then they're bringing things that have already been made um uh, that are on our 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 list of things that we want to have around for building blocks all right next one okay uh, earliest origins uh, on Earth are about three and a half billion years old. And these are these fossilized mats of um, basically blue-green blue algae. So when you cut them open, you see the striations and they're just, they're just blue-green algae that's in big sheets. And that's how they're... Um, and this is, this is like if you were to yep. slice one of these guys mm -hmm. down, this is the, the, the cross section. You'd see mat upon mat upon mat. That. Yep. All right. And then um, I want to shout out to cell walls. So <laughs> blue green algae is a, is a, it's a protist, right? So it has, uh, it has a cell wall. So it's a, it's a single celled organism. Um, but it may seem like they're super simple, but the thing is just the cell wall itself is one complicated thing. It's that big, crazy molecule over there. It's got the blue, well, it's, it's the artist rendition, but it, all those H's and C's that you see there. Um, no, no, there, yeah, green, yeah, there, yeah, yeah, that, that's the molecule. And it's one heck of a molecule and it has a polar head, that's the blue part, and then a non-polar tail, it's the green part. And then all of those are aligned. So that bilayer sheet that you're seeing, you got the heads on one side, little tails on the other side, but it has to have two layers. See how complicated that is? I mean, that's amazing, right? So even the blue-green algae is that complicated. Um, and what's even more amazing about this to me is just on the base level, I'm, a bio, I'm not a biologist, I'm a physicist, that those polar heads are interacting with water molecules who are naturally polar. So one side's considered hydrophilic, which it likes the water. The other side is hydrophobic. It doesn't like the water. And that's how, that's how that whole keeps it out keeps, keeps it out in. keeps it in keeps it out that's amazing i mean that's complicated yeah. so how did that get created so obviously something had to come way before and the strumming those, those channels and those gates and the chan and the gates oh my god this keeps getting more complicated i know okay all right so this is what uh, Albie scott was referring to we attempted or millie uri uh, attempted in 1952 to take these inorganic molecules put them in a vat send electri uh, electricity through them. So that's the spark, um, like little lightning and create, well, life. And then the answer is no, they did not create life. Um, uh, and this experiment has been tried many, many, many times since then. And we always get what I call tar or what they call tar. Is that if you just keep, it's like cooking dinner, right? You just cook your dinner and cook your dinner some more and you keep, keep cooking. And you keep <laughs> cooking and you just get this black sludge eventually. Um, they don't get life, you get the black sludge. So um, we realized then we were going down the wrong rabbit hole with this. So there, there has to be a, a, a different recipe for life. And that gave rise to the RNA world hypothesis. And that's, we've been going on that for a while. And uh, the, the attempts now are up from from the 80s to like now is to try to create RNA in the laboratory because RNA seems to be a molecule that um, really could be the precursor to DNA. Um, and it's more complicated than a protein. So proteins are really important because they do things in your cells. They're the ones that actually have the actions in your cells. Um, DNA are the complicated instructions in your cells. They don't do anything. They just hold the information. But RNA is somewhere in the middle. And so the idea is if we could, if we could first form that, then, then maybe we got something. Mm -hmm. And then everything could be, you know, would shake down from there. So, so these experiments, we've had a laser being uh, uh, shined on something, uh, some chemicals to see if we could produce the RNA bases. Um, then we had um, some chemists in Munich trying to form the R RNA bases with some other chemicals. Um, and then 
again in 2009, they're doing the same sorts of things, but now they're synthesizing RNA enzyme, enzymes. All right, so the whole idea is, can we get the uh, RNA? And, and so far, eh, not so much. Um, so synthesizing RNA in the lab has not been successful and, and people are maybe moving away from that hypothesis. Mm. So that's, that's the end of that, that's 2020. Um, however, I did find some serious biomedical engineering going on. So we now know the code that makes you and I so well that we can reproduce it. And then we can take that code and we can put it in living tissue and, and, and make it work. <laughs> and that's amazing. Yeah. So, so literally creating synthetic DNA and putting it into a cell and making the cell do what we want. That sounds like a really good science fiction. Oh, science fact movie. Heck yeah. Huh. All right. So that's where we're ending our talk today. I hope I wasn't too long winded, <laughs> but I mean, the short answer is we can't shock our way. Uh, we can't shock somebody back to life. All right, so it can't be like Frankenstein, um, but we are really moving into uh, just a absolutely brave new world in terms of um, uh, creating synthetic life. I think that's where we're going. Yeah. And of course, we have to we have to know and understand how electricity works mm -hmm. and these cell membranes across these cell membranes through these channels, and it's so so baked into the way mm -hmm. living tissue works, living cells work, right. that you can't avoid electricity. Mm -hmm. You have to understand it. And, you know, programming DNA is great, but without the electricity, you don't, well, right. get, you don't get it. I mean, you don't have DNA without polar molecules. That's right. And polar molecules, that's Coulomb's law. Yes, it is. So, yeah. Cool. So I'm going to stop sharing, and we're going to take a look at some questions, if any questions came in. And since we've been doing the presentation, we haven't really paid very close attention to the, the questions as they were coming in. So I'm going to kind of zoom up to the, the top here and we'll take a look and see what's going on here. So I have a question, it says Matt. So when the lightning goes from the cloud to the tree, essentially electrons leave the cloud and end up in the earth, right? So the cloud's now positively charged. What does that do to the cloud? Isn't there some return bolt from the tree to the cloud? Mm. That's very interesting. Yeah, so that's a very good question. So you have ions now in the cloud, and so how do they end up neutralizing? That's, that's, right. a, that's a good question. Um, yeah, there's no exactly there's no return, right? So, um, I, and I guess I don't really have an answer for that. How Do you have a thought on that? Um, uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that the cloud is not a, um, yeah. an entity that exists right. on its own. It's constantly right. interchanging. Sure, um, with air, and stuff with yeah, the air all absolutely, around it. absolutely, and then it's releasing rain at some point. So I think there's processes there. Yeah, but there is, but I know for sure there's no return. Like it's not like it undoes itself yeah. because it's positive. So it's electrons like to move. Um, the ions, that's that's the heavier molecules, and they're going to stay in the cloud. So yeah, it's a good question. So how do they unionize themselves? Um, I was wondering if it caused lightning between clouds or something. It does. There is lightning between the clouds. And so, uh, in fact, um, in fact, a lot of lightning discharges between the clouds before it even gets to the ground because of that bilayer going on there. So you have one cloud higher than another. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll kind of scroll down, see other questions. Uh, what would... Uh, <laughs> Why would a shock that wouldn't kill a human would kill an elephant? Hmm. I don't know about that one. Well, maybe Steve's they're... gone, so we can't ask him to. to... I think it would be it would be placement, right? So yeah. you know, um, it's you know, I have the students handle three thousand to six thousand volts in the lab, and that could kill them if they did something foolish with it. Yeah, that's um, true. But as long as, you know, as long as they're not placing it in, uh, you know, across their body in a way to allow for current to flow, then that it's no big deal. But yeah, yeah I mean, 42 volts can kill a human yeah. um, if yeah. placed properly. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the nature of that question is how you place that voltage across the body of the yeah. object. And in a way, so remember the, what she was talking about at the beginning, the idea that that 
potential, that voltage really is potential in the same way that, you know, a, an object dropped from a height has a potential. And so it's not a perfect analogy, but you can think about, you know, a tennis ball isn't going to hurt your foot if you drop it from right. the top of a building. But if you dropped it from the top of a skyscraper, mm. it might, you know, potential in that sense. So it's not, not a perfect analogy, but thinking about potential as being sort of equivalent to sort of how, how high you're dropping something from, as well as how heavy the object is, how much you know, mass it has. Um, okay, and there's a scary TED talk to watch. Ooh, a scary TED talk. Ooh, synthetic biology. Ooh. Ooh. So in the idea. chat, there's something about that. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Um, so I think that might be it in terms of questions, direct questions. Does anybody else have any other questions uh, before we uh, call it quits for the day? Sorry, we weren't able to answer the age old question. How do you uh, reanimate life? You don't do it with electricity. That's the, the punchline. Sorry. So Mary Shelley's Frankenstein was a tremendous, wonderful story. And at the time when well, humans didn't understand. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, and she was taking, um, apparently she was taking create, creative inspiration from those experiments. She knew about them. Yeah. Oh, by the way, she was 19. I know. Isn't she that crazy? When she wrote that. Amazing. Yeah. So... Uh, science fiction continues to lead and kind of direct the way mm -hmm. scientists and engineers and people mm -hmm. on the cutting edge think about their world. And if it opens up doors for them to think about things in a different way, we wind up with different scientific yeah. ideas and, sure. and act, things to explore and things to consider. Sure. And that's why, you know, you talk to a scientist and they'll tell you about, oh, I love Star Trek or I love, you know, the, mm -hmm. this particular book or this particular science fiction novel because it it helped me think about things in different ways. Yeah. Is there anything that you've ever read that, you know, science fiction wise that ever really captured your imagination? This is a question we ask everybody. Hmm. I put you on the, put you, you on the you spot. You did kind of, cause I wrote, I, I've read a lot of science fiction as a child, but um, of yeah. course now I'm, I'm not going to remember anything. Yeah. I'll remember on my way home. Yeah. I, I always <laughs> remember um, the Martian Chronicles. Oh yeah. Oh people. yeah. Sure. Sure. I was fascinated by those uh, as a kid. Not because I, you know, I, it wasn't the science that fascinated me. It was the exploration of being yeah, sure. someplace new. Sure. Well, so. I liked Dune. Dune was the Dune, first thing that Dune. came to mind. But that's, it's not really a story about science fiction. It's a story about people on a yeah. different planet. So it's like. But the whole traveling without yeah. moving, the space right. and At, folding time. And yeah. Space. And the worms, that's riding the worms. Cool. I want to ride a worm. <laughs> Okay, well, we're going to uh, stop unless anybody has any questions. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm going to kind of stick my head in, in the slide. Ah, thanks for joining us today. We've got more um, events coming up. If you're interested in uh, research on reanimation of living tissue, uh, there's a, a science text author who we're going to be interviewing in February. His name is Frank Swain. He's a science writer, and he wrote a book about how to create a zombie, how to make a zombie. Yes. And so it's going to be a really cool talk. He's not a scientist, but he's talked to and researched uh, the work of lots and lots of scientists. And so we're going to have a, an author interview with him on that. That's coming up in February. So keep an eye out on uh, the KonKon website, and we'll keep advertising and, uh, and sending information out to folks about upcoming talks. And remember, as always, they're always free, and they're always available uh, afterwards on the KonKon website. So thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate your time. Bye, everybody. And thank you very much thank for being you. here. I appreciate it. See you later.